the more authentic we are, you, you, you said it, you know, it's about being wacky and weird. And that's, I think, where we're all becoming more authentic in this mm. new age of Aquarius, this new dawn that's, that's unfolding. And uh, I don't know about you, but I really, and I judge it, the superficial bypassing that happens in spiritual, in spiritual platforms. Mm -hmm. I'm like, come on, guys. You know, not everything's freaking love and light. Uh, You're right. Yes, I want You're to invite right. more of that in. But, you know, t at times being human is, whew, it's just yeah. explosive. And it's learning to navigate our nervous systems and learning to navigate the collective trauma that we can most certainly mm -hmm. connect into. to a broader lands podcast the opinions expressed on broader lands podcast are those of the guest speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of the host or broader lands podcast michelle welcome to broader lands podcast it's an honor and privilege to have you thank you hi boo -boo. thank you so much for having me um hi guys i'm michelle carpenter and i uh, live in new zealand originally from johannesburg south africa lovely to be here today boo boo that's awesome. Yeah. Thank you for coming on. And uh, yeah, I love your story. It's very powerful and um, it's very heart touching at the same time. Um, and I totally can relate to a lot of stuff you said and trying to understand the human condition, you know, and uh, you, you, you explain that beautiful journey of being a human being and, and um, how we're having the human experience very well. So I'm, I'm so grateful to have you on today. Thank you so much. And yes, you know, it's, it is a big story, and I believe that all of us have a story to share. And uh, in the beginning, when I was guided to share my story, I kind of was like, where do I even start? And uh, I realized that even when I've done live functions or you know live events, when I've shared my story, it invokes emotions or feelings in people. Um, and in the beginning, when I first was doing, you know, it's, it's wonderful doing a podcast, but when you're doing these live events and you're sort of watching people's faces and you can see them and you're thinking, shit, like, should I keep going? <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but the beauty of it is, is that, uh, you know, cause my head would kick in and go, this is, this is, this is a heavy energy. This is, you know, and we all want upliftment and we all want, you know, to think that life is great and, but the more I've realized that by sharing, even afterwards, women would come to me and say, gosh, Michelle, I've been sexually abused or, um, you know, I had an alcoholic father or an angry mother. And, uh, and it, I've really had to push myself through in terms of the keep on, keep on the sharing, because I know that it invokes, like I say, emotions in people. And for me, this is part of life you know I'm very much about being connected which I have my wonderful team of the Council of Eight yet at the same time I'm very much about keeping it real and how do we work with being human how do we show up for our human selves and uh, there's a lot in that you know we all know that life can be uh, wonderful we look for the grace we look for the gratitude we look for the miracles but at the same times it's freaking hard at times it's challenging and uh you know, um, so that for me is is navigating and helping people to ride the roller coaster of emotions. So um, again, thank you for having me, and I'm I'm really here to share, and uh, I really want to help people in my sharing of my story, validating once again that we all have a story to share, because often people say, yeah, "Michelle, but you know, you've got a big story," and I'm saying, "But so do you. We all we all have something." in in um and it's validating it's validating ourselves in the sharing um and not judging where we come from mm -hmm. and uh but there's so much comparison often so that's why i say to anybody please you know take on what resonates and what doesn't resonate it's okay just park it for now thank you and you just explained my podcast i try to try to just let people be and agree and disagree and it's okay that's how we grow and understand and question and we, we don't have to be enemies or we don't have to call people weird or whatever. Although I do call it, this is a, um, a, a, 
a spiritual uh, weird podcast for spiritually weird people. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I love that because there is this. Is wackiness and weirdness in so much of what we share and what we express. And I, I truly believe, and I think there was um, a science, something I saw, I think, on Instagram about authenticity. And the more authentic mm -hmm. we are in this journey of being human, we all know that we, we are light. We all know that we are spirit. Uh, but at the same time, we've chosen this uh, wonderful, yet this absolute dynamic and intense journey of, Okay, shit, how do we navigate today? Like right now, how do we navigate today? You know, <laughs> and it is interesting because like even in you and I going backwards and forwards, I think to myself, did I get it wrong? Did I like, did I get the dates wrong? And I'm like, oh, Michelle, just take a big breath. And what was fascinating, if I may share this with you, is I have sure. a wonderful little beetle. Um, you know, the beetle, the scarab beetle from Egypt that a friend gifted mm -hmm. to me. And it's about, be, it's about a new day. And, uh, and I thought, okay, I've just got to open up my windows and, I just thought, okay, just navigate my nervous system because it's very easy for me to go into that fight or flight response in terms mm -hmm. of questioning and did I get it right? Did I get it wrong? And and then I saw the beetle on my table. And I was like, okay, it's a new day, Michelle. It's all righty. So I just look for these little moments, you know, these little moments of confirmation, like mm -hmm. it's a new day and it all works out in the way that it's meant to. And that's an absolute reminder for me, especially if I'm in my fight or flight response to just take a few breaths and just go, okay, all righty. It will all works out. So oh. that's what I think we've got to remind ourselves on a continuous basis. You're so right. And you just, uh, I heard you on another podcast and uh, I forget which one, cause I've listened to you a number of times. I love your message. And, um, Thank um, you. You talked about going to Egypt not too long ago, right? Or a while back. Yes. Yeah, yes. me too. It was it in was, October it's... last year. Really? Okay. When did you yeah. go? Uh, maybe about, I would say six months ago. Yeah. Beautiful. Got, yeah, it was such a beautiful experience. I know it's so so much older than what we're told, for sure. Oh my gosh. <laughs> massive, massive. And did you um did you go to Luxor or were you in Cairo specifically? Like which part did you go to? I went all the way up to Sudan Sudan. Yeah, all, wow. all the way up. So and I went with a, a very uh, wise and uh, great researcher and a hero of mine. His name was Tony Browder. And I actually did an episode wow. on that on episode three <laughs> yeah, with him. So. Wow, I'd have to watch it because it's just yeah. like we're there. Like as soon as you speak about it, it's like there we are, oh, right yeah. there, right now. Incredible, hey? Man, yeah. and it's just, it is something where every time I watch something, or and we, we have a group thread um, on WhatsApp, and there's a friend of ours who's there at the moment who is a part of our group. And may yeah. I share a little bit about it? And sure, just sure. how. Please. In the trusting of, of, again, trusting ourselves, trusting our spirit, trusting our light. Uh, my friend, Jill Cole, we've been doing these hypnosis sessions and the whole of last year and uh, a year and a half ago, we were guided. I, she said to me, where are you? And I said, oh my God, I can, feel the, I can feel the walls. I'm in one of the pyramids and I can feel the light codes. And then six months later, I think it was, we were guided that we would be going on this spiritual quest or this mission to Egypt. And the head kicks in and says, how's this going to happen? How are we going to bring people from across the world? And we had to be there at a specific date on the 26th of October, and we're going to do this activation. The beauty of this, putting this information out there is we were 22 people from 11 different countries that felt this calling mm. to want to be there for this activation. And, you know, both of those numbers are master numbers. And this is where when you're in it and you, you, you know, again, this is part of the, the head and the heart. And I think so many mm -hmm. of us in our trauma responses, sorry, I just want to put this on silent, is about what is the head say and what does the heart say? When the mm -hmm. heart is open and the heart is in the space of the resonance of what our soul is calling us to do, it just happens magically. And that was part of Egypt for me last year. You know, but when the head kicks in, it's like, how are we going to afford this? How's this going to happen? Oh my God, I've got a family. I've got a business to run. And again, it's part of that, just this little moment of me looking at the scarab beetle and saying, it's a new day. Just take it easy. Just relax. Take a few breaths. And that's a reminder of what I teach myself and my clients. And there's a saying, you know, we've got to walk our talks. 
and mm. I'm still learning to walk my talk. And <laughs> but I, for me, the more the more authentic we are, you, you you said it. You know, it's about being wacky and weird, and that's I think where we're all becoming more authentic in this mm. new age of Aquarius, this new dawn that's that's unfolding. And uh, I don't know about you, but I really and I judge it the superficial bypassing that happens in the spiritual in spiritual platforms. Mm -hmm. I'm like, come on, guys. You know, not everything's freaking love and light. Uh, You're right. Yes, I want You're to invite right. more of that in. But, you know, t at times, being human is, whew, it's just it's explosive. And it's learning to navigate our nervous systems and learning to navigate the collective trauma that we can most certainly mm -hmm. connect into. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. And uh, so you're saying that uh, spirituality is not about farting hearts and riding unicorns all the time. <laughs> I'm just no, I agree with you. And I think that's that would be amazing. You know? <laughs> and, you know, one of the things I would lo love for you to touch on <laughs> well, as we get into the episode is um, shadow work, because I know you talk about shadow work. So I love that. And um. Um, yeah, I think that's one of the biggest minorities in today's world. It, it it's, has nothing to do with color. It has everything to do with um, uh, authenticity. That's the biggest minority mm -hmm. in today's world. And mm -hmm. But more people are starting to wake up and find their authenticity and, and, and creativity and, and, and so on. So that's a beautiful thing to watch, you know. Absolutely. And, you know, it's there's so much that I feel that in this awakening process, when we're in our victimhood, we question the why. Why did this happen to me? And I was that, and I can be that still, you know, at times when I'm tired and fatigued and nothing's working out in the way that I'd hoped it to or wanted it to. Uh, but for me in this awakening, and I, I'm assuming that you've seen this too, and, you know, just with everybody putting podcasts together and uh, so many people waking up to their shadow selves, and for me, that's the deep dive. That's the work. That's doing the work. And my husband and I were driving in the car the other day, and uh, he was triggered by something that had happened. And and I always, <laughs> I know when it's coming. And we're both working through our PTSD. Um, I've been in my journey for fifteen years, and it doesn't make uh, me any better than anybody who's just started their journey. That's been on their journey. And my husband's been he he went into the dark night of the soul a year and a half, two years mm -hmm. ago due to COVID. And that's why I say that this is happening for humanity because so many of us have, um, and I've seen this with many of my clients, that they've just gone into this absolute depression. But the suppression of the emotions is where the depression lies within us. And my husband and I were driving and I, and I know when it's coming, it's kind of like he builds and I'm like, okay, open the windows, open the windows, dude. And, <laughs> and, and he, he's, Dude, don't come in, dude. I'm just so annoyed right now. And I said, but we've got to get the energy out. And unfortunately, or fortunately for him, we've chosen each other. We've both chosen each other on a soul level. And and I push, and he pushes me at the same time to do better, to be better. And this is part of the shadow work. And and I said, open the window. I said, because I can feel you. Be I can. I was going to say I can feel you bleeding, but that's not right. But it did. It feels like he was bleeding, you know. And I said to him, you've got to get this emotion out. What's the feeling? He's like, I don't want to do this right now. And I said, Bunny, we call each other Bunny, and, I'm, and his name's Brent. I said, this is where the work happens. And what's the feeling? And he's like, I don't want to do this right now. I said, this is the work. If you want to do the work, what is happening? What's the little boy inside of you? What is he feeling? And, and that's where he just took a big breath. And he said, okay. And I said, okay, between the ages of naught and seven, what's the first number? And he said, I'm seven. I said, okay. What is, I think five, I think I, I, must, I mistakenly said seven, but he's, I think he was five. And he said, okay. I said, take a few breaths, connect with your little five-year-old. What's happening with him right now? What is he sensing? What is he feeling? And, and I'm sharing his story because it is his story to share, but he's the oldest of four. And the oldest of four is the responsible one, normally takes on a lot of responsibility. I'm mm. the middle child, so my victimhood was way out of the charts, man. Like, you know, always thinking the oldest got more than me, thinking the youngest got more than me. Where did I fit into the equation? And as the oldest of four, 
he always felt like the others got more than him. And he just had to recognize and give that little five-year-old a moment of connection and let that little five-year-old know that he is important and to be acknowledged and to be held and to be loved. So examples are when we first met 15 years ago, uh, <laughs> please bless us both, <laughs> bless all of us right now. <laughs> but I laugh because, you know, when, when you look back at the story and you look back at how far we've come in our journeys, we've got to acknowledge ourselves. We've got to find the space to, to find that acknowledge, to find the courage in our journeys but the shadow work is the deep dive. It's the deep dive of what's the emotion, what's stuck there, what's the, 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 the suppression. And it may not be all of ours. It may be his father's or my father's or my mother's or my mother's mother's mother's. That's where the intergenerational trauma, the ancestral trauma comes into it. And uh, it was interesting because as soon as, he, as soon as he connected to that emotion and took a few big breaths, he, he pacified himself. But it's something that we're not taught when we come in, into the world when there's chaos. You know, there's something that, that there's a very real connection to the emotion. But the emotion has to be in my work, has to be let out. So when you talk about love and light and, you know, and everything's just wonderful, the biggest thing I've seen in the last few years of people awakening to themselves is that they don't think that they can be angry or allow themselves that anger. So as an example, another example is meeting somebody and they're like, everything's awesome, everything's love and light. And I'm like, where's the depth? Because you can feel it. I can sense it. I can see it in the energy of what is shown to me when I connect with the client. And for me, it's, you know, the emotion of above and below, within, without. Everything's always in flow, but as the human being that we are, it's often when, when we're holding emotion or we're holding within our throats, mm. the deep dive is connecting into the, uh, the suppressive emotions. And please stop at any time if I'm not making sense, because I just, you know, it just, it just comes to me in the way I understand it. Um, so please, Boo Boo, stop me at any time if you have any questions. No, you're making a lot of sense. I do a lot of research and stuff myself to learn about me, you know, and what I've been through and what, the way I perceive things. And, you know, a lot of times, uh, yeah, the wrong perceptions, how these certain events um, knocked me out of balance and, and um, fogged up my window of perception and, and so on. So, um, yeah, I really appreciate what you're saying. And Thank so, you. Um, and you I know, love uh, how you express that, the fogging up, because that's what it is. It becomes a haze. You know, yeah. um, and, and when things are hazy, when we're in fight or flight or fright or fawn, things are just hazy. And then we, we can't think straight. We can't find our breath. We're just going to automatic contraction, <laughs> you know. Mm. So just to finish off, what I was saying is when we're holding, when we're holding in this part of our body, it affects the lower part of our bodies, our vaginas, our penises, you know, the, 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 the testes. Um, it affects the flow in the body. It affects us in when we, you know, perhaps are constipated or the, you know, the stress modality. Um, my husband has been an adrenaline junkie, and now he's realizing that that was the, I've got to, I've got to get the, I've got to get the body to work harder. And I'd say, no. Where does the emotion sit in that? So now he's allowing the expression of the emotion, and the emotion is for me allowing the vulnerability. When that fogginess comes, that haze comes. It's like, okay, what are we suppressing? What are we suppressing? So, again, breath work, which I know is so incredibly amazing. You know, I'd say to anybody, just let the anger come out through breath. Mm. And when we start to breathe, we, 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 spoke, we, 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 we start to expand more in our breath. But for me, it's, it's in, in that critical moment of when the head kicks in, but that the body is just in a vibration of, I can't think, I can't, I don't know what to do, I don't know what to do. And that's exactly why I was explaining about him being in the car. So I said, get it out, open the windows, get it out, get out whatever you're feeling, get out, because then it creates space in the body. And then we connect with the little person inside of us. 
So the story is what we may perceive at the time that we think it's very real, you know, that, you know, running away from the tiger because the tiger is chasing us. But if I had to have all my siblings and say, well, this is how I remember it. And both my brothers would be like, what, what, what? Mm -hmm. That wasn't true, but it's my truth in that moment. And it's their perception of what their truth is. And when we show up in a space of compassion and we show up in a space of discernment and absolute, absolute love is where we can hold space for one another and say, okay, not say that's, that's not true. That's, that's not how I remember it. Because then again, you're taking away from that little person and how they remember it to be true. I hope I'm making sense. I'm no, just you joking. are. Thank you. You're speaking my language, and I really appreciate it. It's all about understanding the human experience, the human condition. You know, and um, you know what I always sometimes I when I talk to younger um, parents, I try to remind them to look at a uh, their child with a little fragile sign, like like uh, on their brain, because and help them process stuff correctly. Because that stuff, if you don't know how to communicate, because a lot of the trauma. Oh, I like what Gabor Mate says. It's not what happened to you, although that's that. I mean, there's a lot of truth to that, but it's what happens inside you from that um, from that experience and um, just learning how to have people, uh, children, teach them how to process their emotions correctly instead of being a big boys don't cry and all that other stuff because that's more harmful than anything else, right? Um, or or little girls don't you know um, just learning how to process our emotions and properly and and how to have communication trust and honesty and it's okay to feel and you know I didn't know how to do that as a young little boy you know and uh, I don't blame my parents uh, I think my parents did the best they could with with the tools they had you know you know but uh, so yeah it's very important to talk about trauma I mean I'm looking at a society full of trauma and collective trauma and so on you know so. Um, I don't think there's no walking out of this experience without some form of trauma, which means wound, right? <laughs> um, absolutely, absolutely. So, so uh, you're a channeler. So, may I just and... give you a different, a different um, take on that? Sorry, sure. Can I just, can I just, yeah, yeah, you know, yes. it's also it, what's what's important is yes, the adult in us, obviously, because I'm a mom myself, and I know I'm not perfect by any means um I have my moments I snap at my kids and then you know I sit back and say you know when I when I'm able to breathe back into myself again then I'll go and explain to my children and say look I know you don't understand mom's just really stressed right now uh but you know there's the wishy-washy parents respectfully that they they talk for their children I know you're feeling very frustrated right now no just let them have an unraveling let them have a little tanty and have yeah. a tantrum with them uh, so, you know, it's not that we want to blame our parents because they did the best they could do, but it's giving that little person inside of us the moment of saying, oh, I'm so angry at them. Damn it. I wish they'd, know that they'd known better. I wish they'd, like, why didn't they? But that's the moment, not sitting in the moment, not sitting in the anger, not mm -hmm. sitting in the devastation or the frustration or, you know, because those are all the suppressive emotions. And then again, letting it go. and then. Okay, then we, we click back into being an adult once again. But it's yeah. how we, we, we moderate, you know, it's, 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 it's walking with the moderation, moderation of, again, just interpreting, but also allowing the feelings to have the expression. And what I love what you said right now is um, taking ownership and showing that, you know, we're all going to get angry, we're all going to get pissed off, we're going we're gonna to react certain ways. But you took ownership and you showed them, okay, we're going to make mistakes, but look at this is how I, you know, this is how I'm, you, you're honest and you, 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 um, you, you know, took responsibility for you and owned what your behavior as well. If you snapped on them, you know, and I think that's, that's a lot, that's powerful. And I, I appreciate you saying Thank that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. It's important because we can only take ownership for ourselves. And, uh, and again, it's, it's, you know, true responsibility and, sometimes we just, I just don't get it in the moment as much as I've done a huge amount of work as like Egypt, oof, Egypt brought up so many fears for me. <laughs> I'm still working through some of the stuff that Egypt has shown to me and delivered. And, uh, you know, and that's just part of, again, the process of where we led to go. And you think, okay, I've done so much work. Yay. You know, <laughs> and then 
you head somewhere overseas and then you're like, okay. And that was fascinating because so many of us were spiritually aligned in our, in our souls and the connection, yet it was fascinating to watch how we were triggered. And there, I was like, yep, and there's the human. <laughs> there's a little child. <laughs> Uh, and I had a moment where I sounded like my mother, like I became very bossy. I was like, <laughs> okay, Michelle, I've got to work on that part of yourself. <laughs> but it's letting go of the shame, you know, and that's where we, when we spiritually align, where we connect from a soul level, again, that's where we see each other through compassion, through togetherness, through, ah, oh, it's not personal. Ah, oh, they just yeah. had, a little, they had a little moment, they had a little tantrum. Hey, but I love you regardless. Yeah, thank you. I think humility is understanding all parts of you, you know, what we label good and bad. I and, love that. You know, and, uh, you, um, you had a rough upbringing. Um, I was wondering if you would walk us through your, um, your life before a channeler. Sure. Yeah. Um, absolutely. Uh, I, I, I feel it's important to also say this to, to anybody who's listening. But it doesn't mean that because my rough upbringing, my journey was just very different, like I'm a late bloomer. But I know that there's so many people out there that connect very directly because people often have this assumption nowadays that I'm hearing a lot of, like, oh, okay, um, because, you know, there's a lot of trauma inside of us. Like, does that mean that I have to do like 15 years of work like Michelle in order to channel? Mm -hmm. And I'm going to just say, no, you know, that's just, it's my journey. So again, Anybody listening, take it on. And what doesn't resonate, you know, just park it. Uh, a big part of my journey, well, my journey up until this point in time has, uh, I was born in Zimbabwe, uh, which was Rhodesia at the time. And I, um, my, my dad was a Rhodesian soldier. My mom was a, a young mom. I have an older brother who's three and a half years older than me. And there was a lot of fear, a lot of what I remember being with my dad going to war was my mom locking us, myself and my oldest brother, in the room at night. You know, we the three of us slept in a bed. I, I never got to ask my mom before she passed over what was the fear about, unfortunately. Uh, but, you know, with my dad being a soldier, uh, it came with his own uh, abusive ways. He was, he was also severely abused as a child. His father was an alcoholic. Um, my mom was a very, very... Uh, angry woman from what I can remember as a young person like we were smacked we were hit uh, she doesn't remember a lot of it but there was a lot of times where just to give an example I was two years old and she was potty trained me and I remember this because she shared this very openly with her friends and it became like a, a standing joke uh, but she took this like a, a badge of honor uh, she had potty trained me once we had used to have the toweling nappies in those days and the, the little um, waterproof and uh she smacked me so hard because I'd wet my panties and she smacked me so hard and uh, that I never wet my panties again, you know. And there were just these moments that I, that, that I, I, as I, as I sort of working on myself, I was like, wow, that was rough, man. I was sexually abused by her younger brother at the age of five. Again, didn't know it was abuse. Kept it to myself. And uh, because obviously, you know, I was told to keep the secret. And again, didn't know there was anything wrong with it. And there were just these, these very big moments in my life. I remember being three years old, my dad coming home uh, from one of his call out missions as a soldier. And my mom was really angry at him because he had gone out partying. And I remember as a little three year old uh, sitting and stroking my dad's face and saying, it's going to be okay, dad. It's going to be okay because he was crying, you know, and he was, my mom was kicking him out. The interesting thing is, is that fast forward to where I am now, and I'll come back to parts of my journey, is when I first started my, my own uh, uh, waking up to myself, is that I was always in relationships, packing my bags and running, packing my bags and running. And then my sister-in-law said to me the one time, oh, your brother does the same thing. I was like, what? But my mom was always packing my dad's bags and telling him to leave. So it became a, a condition. It became a way of running leaving the relationship. Uh, so I was then a dancer. My folks then had to leave Zimbabwe. And uh, I now know what that had felt like starting in a new country, even though I was a much older person, 
um, it's tough, man. You know, when you immigrate, we didn't flee South Africa. It was a choice that we chose to to do for ourselves and our family, our kids. But, you know, it comes with a big amount of stress. And uh, in this big amount of stress, I started to understand more of my mom and dad's journey of leaving Zimbabwe and heading to South Africa because mm-hmm. there was land invasions happening. There were massive threats happening. Uh, we had to start from scratch again. I come from a dancing background. And uh, I then had bulimia as a teenager because I needed to purge. I needed to, I didn't like my body. I was trying to release on some level and trying to, just trying to figure out life. And then I became an angry teenager. And then every time I saw my uncle, I started to remember things. And I was like, oh my God, this is wrong. I read like an agony on thing in a magazine the one day and then realized as a teenager that what he did to me was wrong. Didn't know up until I was 14, 15 years old. Um, my dad had had two affairs when we were young and this became my mom's, my mom's very thing to me was like, Michelle, do not let man dominate you. Do not let a man dominate you. Well, obviously all I did was let a man dominate me. So the control stigma, the control factor was there. And I was just, I just wanted to be loved, boo-boo. I just, Mm -hmm. so I, I was very, uh, sarcastic as a teenager. It was one of my defense mechanisms. I used to get very sickly, even as a young girl, tonsillitis. Um, And if people want to know, you know, what I'm very open about my sharing of what happened sexually, in my sexual abuse, sorry. Uh, But it kind of, when I put the dots together, it made sense to me uh, as to what had happened in the sexual abuse. And then I started to self-sabotage because I wanted, I knew something was wrong. Clearly inside of my soul, I knew that what had happened to me, there was, even though I had to suppress the secret, uh, because my I was on a bicycle, on the back of a bicycle, a friend's bicycle, and my toe got caught in the chain of the bicycle, and they, they were going to amputate my toe. But that became a pattern, unknowingly so, that, oh, my God, I landed up in hospital, or I'd get sick, then I'd get the love, I'd get the love. So these were patterns that I started to notice. Fast forward to being 16 and a half, 17, my best friend had a kidney transplant and she passed over. And she passed over in one of the hospices in Johannesburg. And I remember watching her parents go for a counseling session. And again, this is how our soul aligns us at the time, but not even knowing that, you know, again, connecting the dots. And I remember watching her parents come out of a counseling session, sitting on the couch and thinking, wow, how does the counselor handle? How are they not, you know, you're surrounded by people who are terminally ill. How are they, how are they just okay? She passed over. I gave myself one or two days to grieve, went back to school. I actually went back to school on the day that she, that we got the phone call, funny enough. My mom said, are you sure? And I'm like, I've, I've got to be the martyr. I've got to show up. Again, martyrhood leaves us in, in our open wound of being a victim. I'll show everybody. I'm okay, I've got this. But I didn't have it, I just suppressed it. Mm. Lots of uh, bronchitis, kidney infections, bladder infections. Again, my body was just in fight or flight. And then brought in guys into my space that I just loved, I thought, would love me. And uh, they would cheat. So you see how there's another pattern. So I'm just sharing all these miraculous patterns. They were like, eh. Eh, eh, sirens in my face. I was like, didn't get it, didn't get it. When I was 24 years old, I was a sales rep for many years and I was driving on my side of the road and I had a cool drink and I looked down to put a straw into the cool drink and I collided with something. I was in an area where there's a farm, lots of farms, cows, horses, and I didn't know what I'd collided with, but I pulled my car over and four people had stopped and uh, my windscreen was damaged there was smoke coming out of my car and I was in such obviously deep state of shock trauma and the 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 two gentlemen walked across and they said are you okay and I said I don't know what I've hit is it a dog an animal I I don't know and I unfortunately I'd hit a human person Mm. it turned out that it was a young girl of a big young girl of 14 years old Uh, I become clearer in sharing my stories because a lot of people have assumed me growing up in the apartheid era. I've seen this in one or two of the comments in different podcasts I've been on where, oh, she was black. Let me guess she was black. It's like, what the hell, people? Are you missing the story? It doesn't matter about the color. 
I took a life and I was deeply, deeply traumatized by this moment in my life. And I know that doing work on myself, it was a soul contract, still doesn't make it any okay from my myself and working through the, you know, the, the knowing that I, nobody ever wants to share this kind of story that you've taken somebody's life. And um, her mom had phoned me as an earth angel about three, four months later. She got my number off the accident report and she wanted to know how I was doing. Mm -hmm. And I was blown away. I thought it was a, I thought it was a, a joke. I thought it was my ex-husband playing a joke on me. And she said, no, Michelle, she was seven years old and she had a car accident. She just unfortunately couldn't read. Um, she couldn't read the, how traffic worked. Didn't make it any better. Honestly, it just, it was but she was an earth angel and I sobbed. I started to sob that this woman even took the time to find the compassion to ask me how I was doing. Oh, it was massive. <clears throat> it still is. <clears throat> Excuse me. <laughs> so I have these moments <laughs> where it just really hits home, you know, in my soul where I go, wow, that was pure compassion in that moment that the mom had lost somebody, but wanted to find out how I was doing. And that's beautiful. Thank it you. Really and, is, yeah. Yeah, it was. <clears throat> and my hope is one day, <laughs> one day I can share this with no tears. <laughs> because, you know, I, right now my mind's going, damn it, Michelle. Wow. Like I was, I was handling. You see how quickly the judgment kicks in? Mm -hmm. um, but thank you for acknowledging that it is a beautiful story. And it's a beautiful moment. And um, so, you know, I suppressed all of this. And it comes up for the healing in the moment. And I want to say thank you to you for just acknowledging that and holding space for me. Uh, because that, for me, is just being in the sharing of the expression um and then <clears throat> excuse me in one year of this this it was 1998 i'd been in a relationship <clears throat> it became verbally and physically abusive uh this all happened within six months i then was made redundant or retrenched by the company i'd been headhunted to and then two months later knocked over and killed this young girl all in one year You'd think that all, they will all be wake-up calls. They weren't. I just kept putting my head down. And yeah. my, my absolute uh, uh, wonderment was the more stressed I am, the more I can focus, the more sales I bring in. Well, clearly, it's not a great place to, to work from. And I didn't know that at the time. You know, for me, the, again, the breath, being in a moment of presence, being in a moment of clarity, of just, ah, the parasympathetic nervous system instead of the sympathetic nervous system. But I suppressed it once again, went to one or two sessions. Nobody suggested, Michelle, you need to go and have the scene too. Like you've got to go and work on yourself. And um, fast forward, got married within eight months of all of this happening, eight months later. Fast forward to my life, 32 years old, living in the UK, then decided to go back to South Africa. Um, my ex-husband and I had a little baby girl. And another pattern uh, had decided to develop and uh, my ex-husband had decided to have an affair. Having said that, though, he was backwards and forwards to South Africa, backwards and forwards to London. And I was like, what, what the heck's going on? What, what the heck's going on? And I then decided to, two, two years later, we were separated, but I decided to get involved in another relationship because I just wanted to be loved once again not the finest moment in my life because I'd had a little baby girl and I'd put her through a lot of change. Mm. And I was just, again, living from that stress response, stress response, like there's got to be somebody who loves me. I've got to do better. I can show up better. There's, and man alive, I'm still working through, and I want anybody to know this, I'm still working through so much of that guilt that I'd had at the time and the remorse, the shame of, of what was I thinking? Man alive, if only, you know, hindsight. Only we can go back in time. Well, we're here right now. So that's part of the, 
the learning for me and part of what I teach and part of what I work with is it's okay. Find the forgiveness, find the space of grace, find the compassion inside of us. And, you know, I love how you said that's beautiful in that moment because you held space for me. The compassion was there for me, even though my head was going, damn it, you were holding this together. You were sharing this so, so well. <laughs> you know, so do you see how those parts of ourselves play themselves out so quickly? Mm. Yes. Um, so fast forward to then finding out my ex-husband having an affair, me going on my own journey of, you know, seeking love once again. And um, I'll never forget this. My little girl was in the hospital and my ex-husband and I, he wasn't my ex at the time. We were still married on paper. And I said, okay, come on, let's just shoot the breeze. Let's just, I've done shit, you've done shit. Just freaking, let's just clear the, clear the airwaves. And then he admitted he was having an affair. But you know what was fascinating, boo-boo, is my mom picked up on this because she saw, she saw the behavior, she saw the patterns. Mm -hmm. She's like, he's having an affair. But he just, I just wanted, I wanted him to admit it, just to share it with me. But he didn't for whatever reason. And uh, so kudos to my mom. I've come to realize that she was actually a really strong woman. And the anger she held and the anger she projected onto me was she just wanted, she wanted me to be stronger. She didn't want me to be her. Mm. And it came at a price. You know, it came with many consequences because even me going with this other guy and I was still married on paper, my parents wanted, we're going to take my um, daughter's, uh, sorry, they were going to take my ex-husband's side in court because I wanted sole custody of my daughter. There were just moments where I was like, where do I fit? This is just crazy. Like, you're choosing my husband over me. So, yes, there's a lot in my story. And I share snippets of it because sometimes it's just like, oh, that happened. You know, you remember, but then you forget. And then you have a moment like this and you go, oh, 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 yeah, that happened. Okay, there's more forgiveness to have. <laughs> All right, Michelle, you've got to dig deeper. There's another part inside of you. And I'm always sort of scanning my body as best as I can to go, ah, oh, hold on, I can feel this. As I'm sharing my story, ah, oh, hang on. There's something, oh, okay, there's, there's a little memory that's coming up. And then I know that I've got to dig deep because remember, our organs store emotion. Every single part of our fascia stores emotion. Everything stores emotion. Um, so I got divorced and uh, have now gotten remarried. And we have another child who's a son who's 13 years old. And through that, my now husband and I have had to work through a lot of the patterns of my mother and my father. Bless his cotton socks because he chose me <laughs> when, I was, when I was starting to stand up for myself, where I was going to become that woman who freaking knew everything, who was going to show men, who was going to show the, that I'm a light warrior and, and <laughs> all of the above, all the self-righteous stuff, you know. And we chose each other again on a soul level because – He's taught me to find my voice. And he had suppressed a lot of his pain, suppressed a lot of, like I say, he's, he's, he was an adrenaline junkie. And he mm. was, when he was angry, he was like, I'm going to get on my bicycle. I'm going to just, I'm going to just, <laughs> that's a great way to do it. But at the same time, the deep dive is working with the emotional body. Uh, that's just my opinion. You know, guys, take it, don't take it. But the emotions is always the last place most of us leave it to go to. Um, and so anyway, I'm, I'm here right now and I've started to just 15 years ago. The interesting thing is I went to go see a clairvoyant and he just said to me, you don't know how to love yourself. And I'm like, dude, just help me with my anger. Help me with my, just, just help me with my stress. And he's, you just don't know how to love yourself. Damn it. But what was profound, it was masculine energy that the universe brought into my space. A young, beautiful man. He was in his twenties. And he just said, I think you need to go on this course. And guess what? The course was a weekend away with one of the hospice um, uh, facilitators. And the interesting thing was that that weekend was life-changing because mm -hmm. the facilitator I chose had a very similar story to me, older, but she'd also been sexually abused, also knocked over a young girl, also had a husband that, I mean, she had four children, or she has four children, but it was interesting how our timelines brought us together. And I didn't like her. 
I did, I, she was the last facilitator on the board and I was chatting to everybody and socializing with everybody. I was like, damn it, I've got her. <laughs> Put my name down. Best thing that ever happened for me. Because nine years later, after I'd knocked over and killed this young girl, she had um, started to help me with the emotions that I had suppressed so, so deeply inside of me. I cried so hard, boo-boo, because she had said, how did you feel? How did you feel? I said, what do you mean? How did you feel? How did you feel? She just kept pushing on. What was the emotion? What was the feeling? I cried so hard, it felt like my head was splitting open because I'd realized it's the devastation, the disappointment, the, oh my gosh, there's just no words. How do you even articulate how you felt in taking a life? How do you? You know, there's, there's just no words to express it. You just got to be in the raw, 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 deep, deep, deep emotion of severe unclearness. That's all the way I can describe it right now because it's unclear. How, how do you say to somebody, well, you know, just this was happening in my day-to-day -day life. And, but then I then started to go see her and then my sexual abuse started to come up. And I had to learn to forgive my five-year-old self. I didn't even know that was a thing. And then I just started to gain traction. And then I became a hospice caregiver, working, you know, part-time. Um, the universe has some very mysterious, wonderful uh, sense of humor at times. And my first patient at the time was, now bear in mind that our liver holds resentment and holds uh, anger. And if you think about it, the liver is all about detoxing in the body, you know, so it's, it's, it's phenomenal how profound it actually is as, a, as an organ. But emotionally, it holds all of the above, the, 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 the toxicity. The... And my first patient was a, a young guy who had liver cancer. And I didn't see the symbolism at the time, but afterwards I was like, wow, you know, there's always a reflection playing itself out. There's always a part. That's play, that, that the universe brings into our space to help us look at it. And often the people who trigger us the most are the ones that are the biggest teachers for me. <laughs> we want to, I, I call it, we want to throat punch them. We want to, oh, annihilate <laughs> them. And, you know, I'm South African, so I'm on. <laughs> you know, a lot of us that have been and experienced, been through a lot of crime, uh, you know, we've experienced a lot of crime. So again, the fight or flight responses have just been like there. Fast forward to where I am in New Zealand. Somebody had said to me, Mish, and I've been working with grief. I've been working with trauma in, in South Africa. She said to me, do you think you suffer from PTSD? Let me think about that one. <laughs> I had nobody had ever said that to me before in all my you know my yoga facilitations and maybe they did and it maybe went straight over my head more than likely I was like yeah Shh, okay let me okay I need to address this now <laughs> and it was just fascinating you know when you hear you hear and I'm gonna give people a take on that when you hear h-e-a-r you're here in the present moment. When we truly listen to ourselves, the universe brings those people in to help us to hear what's going on and help us to navigate. So, yeah, you know, in, in, the, in, the, in the younger version of who I am, my mom, like I said, was angry. She slapped me at 16 years old across my face in a very busy supermarket. There was a lot of alcohol involved. I've had to make peace with people, including myself, in alcohol. I've had to. My dad was an angry drunk. When my mom started with dementia, my dad just went cold turkey like this. He just stopped drinking. And uh, he became self-righteous. He's like, you guys aren't going to have alcohol in my property. I'm like, are you freaking kidding me? Like, <laughs> dad, do you remember the shit that's ensued and that you've created? and don't you come with that nonsense, you know? Um, but I admire him because, like I said, you know, he's a Rhodesian soldier and he, 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 his words used to be, and this is where I say to anybody, do not ever think, do not ever think that a leopard cannot change their spots. Do not ever think that people cannot change because my mom passed over just over two years ago 
My dad's now in a retirement village in a, in a tiny little room with a lot of older people. He's still a very young soul in himself, but he's become older because mm. he aged. He became my mom's caregiver. My mom's, she had breast cancer and uh, dementia, and I'm so grateful that the cancer helped her to pass over sooner than the dementia because for most of us who have parents who have been around dementia or Alzheimer's, it's a, it's just a, in, it's just a terrible, terrible place to be, but it brings a lot of healing. My mom was starting to tell me how much she loved me. I was like, wow, wow. You know, she softened. So it, my dad had softened. He had lost a lot of himself in being her caregiver, but he'd softened. And you know, Boo Boo, about three, four weeks ago, he had said to my husband and I, they were freedom fighters in Zimbabwe. I don't blame them for fighting, for wanting to claim back what they were, what was taken away from them. They just wanted to vote. I never, ever, ever thought I'd hear that come out of it because I used to get I used to get really triggered when people would say to me, they're freedom fighters. And I'd say, no, my dad said they're terrorists. But then something changed. And for my dad to say that, he's clearly rethought and find the compassion about those people that were fighting for something that they felt was right for them at the time. You know, yes, did it bring waves of massive, massive, massive trauma, clearly, just in, you know, and I'm just one person that is sharing this. You know, I remember my dad driving in convoy and, and I remember watching him as a young girl and his knuckles, you know, the fear, the fear which creates anxiety, which creates the, you know, if we talk vibration, when we're in fear, the anxiety is the contraction, the contraction, the contraction. And the mind's just like, I don't know, 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 I don't know. But then when we start to expand and we start to give our body space, and that's what I've learned with my post-traumatic stress is that I've had to find the space in my body. And as soon as I can, even in my day-to-day -day work, I'm really good at going into a trance space, which I'm so, so grateful that that's the expansion that's been created for me in my heart and my soul. Yet it takes work and we are worth it. That's the self-love. I've had to learn to love myself. I've had to learn that it's not going to come from the outside. I've got to give it to myself. I had to learn to acknowledge myself. I've had to learn to acknowledge that there's courage in my story, that there's there's a braveness in sharing my story without having to uh, over, uh, over judge myself in sharing my story. Because, you know, going back to what I started with in the beginning in, in the sharing, it's great because here it just lands, you know, you're not with people uh, wondering what their perception is of me, uh, wondering, you know, like I said earlier on, somebody, two people judge me. Why didn't I go to jail? And, oh, let me guess, it was a black girl that she knocked over. I thought to myself, wow, are you kidding me? Is that what you got out of an hour sharing of, wow. And I'm very grateful to the, the person who interviewed me. He took those two comments off because that's going to create a hornet's nest. Yeah. You know, guys, I was acquitted. I went to court backwards and forwards. There was this hazy cloud over me, that fog that you described earlier on. And I just lived in a state of flux, like, am I going to go to jail? Am I going to go to jail? Am I going to go to jail? And there were so many parts of those two, three years that, again, bless my husband, my ex-husband, you know, he took me in a deeply traumatized state in my life, you know, so I'm not surprised. And all I tried to do was control life, control life, you know, and I cried. I was in a deep depression and I didn't know that at the time. Nobody had ever gone, Michelle, do you ever think you're depressed? Michelle, do you ever think you need to go to a counselor? And if somebody just said that to me, but again, our parents didn't know any different. My dad used to mock me, you and your universe, you and your feelings. Do you think you're always going to go for work? And I'm like, yep, dad, until I, until I have my last breath, and I don't do it often like I used to, but I still find somebody, if I can feel that I'm off, if I can feel that I... I, I find the people that can hold space for me, like you. 
You know, thank you're holding you. space for me right now. So thank you. No, I appreciate it. I totally relate to you because, um, you know, I had a lot of different experiences myself. And one of them that I'll mention right now is, um, you know, I was raised in the streets. You know, I was uh, a lot of gang environment. And um, one time I got into it with some guys' words. And then um, we get into the car and I had some females with me. And uh, one of the girls that switched seats with her friends in one car and came with us right after me saying stuff to these guys because I was drunk. And I would always soothe myself with alcohol. I needed relief because I didn't know how to deal with my emotions. Those were my coping skills, getting drunk, right? And um, Carl Jung called it in Latin, spiritus contra spiritum, spirits versus spirits. So, so for this like spiritual malady within me, all this unresolved trauma, trapped emotions and so on, um, I needed something to fix that. So I had alcohol. Of course. You know, course. and um, but, you know, um, we're getting alcohol. It's past two o'clock. That's last call in, in um, California. But this place sold liquor after hours, right? So um, we get there and uh, said something to these guys. My buddy talked me into getting into the car. This girl switches seats. As we're at the red light, these guys start shooting at us. Um, well, they start saying stuff at us. They start throwing rocks and stuff. And so I get out of the car driven by fear. You know, anger is a form of fear. And yep. I rush out to these guys, you know, and I, I don't think about consequences. Well, they start shooting at me. And that girl that went in the switch seats with, with, with one of my friends and went in our car, gets shot right in the head and dies on my friend's lap. You know, I don't know how to deal with that. You know, I knew it was my fault. And I, it, because of me, her life is gone, you know. And I didn't know how to cope with that. So the best thing I could do is drink, drink that, those feelings down, you know. And there's a lot of so other stuff, sorry. you know. Um, no, no, I appreciate it. I appreciate you expressing, um, expressing your, your, uh, your life and being raw, being real and, and really just showing the human condition, the human experience. And, and, but we, you know, um, and I had a lot of anger. I, I, I would punch people in the face. I, I, I had been in so many fights. It's crazy. And I ain't the toughest guy in the world, but I just, I, I'm in so much pain. Hurt people need to hurt people or traumatize people, traumatize people. You know, and, um, I did that in so many different ways, but um, without the mud, there's no lotus flower. And I, I'm hearing that in your your beautiful share as well. And uh, one thing I loved about um, you sharing with your father right now, and, and even with the mother of the um, young child that passed away, um, understanding in Buddhism, they say understanding is love's other name. And we try to just understand ourselves and what happened to us. Um, or, or conflicts or people's behavior or what, when I can try to understand, it brings me back to love, you know, and I can love this person. I may not agree with stuff, but I, I can love them have, because I have compassion now, you know? And, and, yes, yeah. but you have compassion for yourself. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, when we don't have compassion for ourselves and uh, thank you for sharing, you know, it's, it's, it, in our sharing creates a, uh, an openness because there's such a perception once again of us being love and light and we've got our shit together. No, we don't. Mm. I don't. And I'm very open in, in, in just sharing the everyday experience of who I am. And when, when, when we have PTSD, it shows up in ways that sometimes, you, you, you know, when you just have those moments where you think, Oh, okay, I've got, this together and you're kind of like walking you're like woo I'm doing life man <laughs> the universe is like let's see if she's really doing life as well as she thinks she is <laughs> and and then something just boom, trips you up again and it's kind of like the crutch is back again mm. and even in alcohol I've I teach my kids sober thoughts drunken words and whatever we've suppressed it's it's exactly like you say, you know, in, in you you weren't thinking rationally, you just cannot. And when we're in that fight, flight, fright response. So do you know anything about the the the, the um sort of the crime that happens in South Africa? No, a little bit, maybe you can expand on that for me. Okay, so you know, there's been such massive shifts in South Africa. There was obviously the, the apartheid era and some people may say that it's now shift and there's there's a lot of brutality that is happening. Unfortunately, the same happened in Zimbabwe 
and you know there's there's it's, it's there's 59 million people in South Africa. We are shared that it, it's been known that we're known to be the Rainbow Nation. When Nelson Mandela came out, the world mm-hmm. celebrated, and we often think if only it come out earlier because you know he just brought so much beautiful change to to the world, not only to our country, but the pendulum has swung where um, there's now so much, uh, like I say, brutality. And we've been affected. My husband has had so many guns brought to his head. He was also, as a young man, a fighter. And uh, he's, he's, I've started to see him in a different way. You know, this, we separated twice. This was my second husband. We were, we, you know, we were looking at, you know, going our separate ways. But the one day I just realized that he was a deep reflection of myself. Who am I to go... Oh my God, I've got my stuff together and, and, you know, look at my body language, like, uh, I'm, you know, all love and light. And this is what I'm sharing to the world when there's still stuff going on in my home. And the one day he just said to me, you show up for everybody else, show up for me. And I was like, what do you mean? I thought I did, you know, I might show up in, in cooking or helping the kids or whatever, but in a deep, deep way, I wasn't showing up for myself and him. But the trauma is real. So to go back to South Africa, you know, we had somebody come into our home and my husband screamed so loud because he just, he went to, and, and, and in the judgment, you know, we'd go to barbecues or we call them bras in South Africa. And, you know, people would say, oh, somebody had jumped over our wall at 2, 2 a.m. in the morning and you hear gunshots all the time and uh, you know, and my husband would say, well, why don't you do this and this and this and this? And I'd say to my album and say, you cannot judge until you're in the moment. You never know how you are going to respond because you just don't. Mm. So you describing the very real situation with you, you know, running and you're running towards what I would say, shit, what were you, th- I would say, what, what were you thinking? But you weren't thinking, you just weren't thinking in that moment, you know? Because you just weren't the brainstem, the the fight flight, the the the, the limbic brain just goes, yeah. just bring it, man. I'm gonna freaking take you out. And it, when you look back again in hindsight, and this is what happened with him, he just he, something said to him when they were in our home, just scream as loud as you can, get them off the property. So he did. He lost his voice for three weeks, but then he went into fight mode. And we'd always had a an agreement: if he's out. I lock the doors, I call the police, and the kids and I go into a room. Mm. And once he's out the home, he's out the home. And then he went into that fight mode. Then he was like, bring it. And he was looking for them. Him and another guy were looking for them. And interesting enough, I got a message in that moment where they were. They were in a nursery school, these guys. And I'm so grateful I didn't phone my husband or tell him where they were because who knows what he would have done or what would have happened to him. Yeah. And they actually were, the nursery school, they, they actually found them on the cameras. They were sitting there. They had stolen stuff from us and they were sitting there. And again, again, it's no, there's no judgment towards any color, any creed. You know, it's a very real assumption that as a white South African female, that immediately like we're racist. And that's what we've got to change. That's the stigma that we've got. That's the dogma. That's, the, that's where I see this world of who we are when we see people in who they are as the soul, as the unconditionally loving person who has been through who knows what, who knows what people's stories are, boo-boo. We've mm-hmm. got no idea. You know, I could have sat here and gone, wow, you, you are so knowledgeable because look at all your books behind you. But we've all, again, got a story. And when we, when we just stand back in discernment and say, wow, I wonder why that person's angry right now. I wonder why that person's reactive. And just go, whew, okay. And then, because that's what the head says, but then you bring yourself back and you go into your heart and you say, wow, I wonder what's gone on in their world that they went from zero to 300 in two seconds and their mouth shot off. People aren't reactive as children. We are so 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 part of source even now we are you know there's that inner child that's that's here right now we've both got our inner children here but as an adult we're still learning to cope in the ways that we cope but how often do we ever 
do we ever say to one another? Wow. Gosh, what can I, what can I do for you right now? Mm. And in a moment of anger, you've just got to just be there for that person. But most of us, based on how we've been programmed, me, like I say, my mouth, and I've had to learn to just breathe in the moment. If my husband's having a moment, or I, or I teach him, get it out. Get, if we're in the mm. car, open the windows, get the energy out. But we just never know. And I truly believe this is the world that we are recreating for ourselves, where we can just show up in a space of compassion and love. Because when we're in love, our hearts just warm mm. and they open up. And we cry together and we hold each other together and we say, we've got this. I've got you. How often as a kid did anybody ever say to you, I've got you, buddy. I'm so mm. sorry you've gone through what you've gone through. And just hold you because the natural thing is you might want to fight them, even as a teenager. Get out of my face. Get out. Mm. But that's a good, like, if you have somebody who's strong enough to hold you, and that's what I've taught my kids. Go in the room and just scream it into the pillow. Punch mm. the mattress. You know, and I hope that I've planted seeds on some levels. But I see their patterns coming up. I see the way that we've conditioned them. And I'm like, I say to my husband, let's own our stuff, man, because they're just reflecting a part of us right now. So there's so much to the dynamic of who we are in our stories. And... You know, I've shared a lot, and thank you for allowing me to share. But there's a lot that I I know that I haven't shared because I just wasn't meant to for whatever reason today. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And I, I love how you talked about um creating illness. You know, uh, different types of illnesses when you were younger, and science tells us you know we have about sixty thousand thoughts that flow through our brain uh, per day. And it's all repetitive. 90% of that is repetitive. So um, if we don't work on ourselves as human beings and get rid of these, um, you know, these emotions stay trapped in us and these traumatic experiences uh, through memory and emotion and emotionally, um, it creates sickness within ourselves. So I, yeah. um, I, I love what you talked about. It's important to work on ourselves uh, as human beings or that stuff gets trapped in us and actually you know we got all these different types of illnesses going on sicknesses and and, and it fogs up our window of perception at the same time absolutely yeah so thank you absolutely you know it's it's sorry oh, go, no, go go ahead. Ahead. Go ahead. no go ahead i was gonna say when we start to trust our soul's journey we get out of the why why did this happen to me the victimhood you know, have you ever done or worked with the victim triangle? I never have, no. Okay, it's a fascinating process where, um, you know, we have the rescuer, the perpetrator, and the the victim. Mm. If you look at that as a triangle, you know, it's 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 our Merkaba, what we're born into, what we're born with. You know, we have we store all these records, hence. Past lives for me are timelines playing themselves out right now. That's why Joe Dispenza talks about the future's not out there, the future's happening right now. So it's looking at the timeline of where we're at right now. And yes, I know that where we live as as, as human beings, we have time, we've got to, you know, we've got to regulate our time, we've got to be on time. There's all these different ways of <clears throat> excuse me, how we show up. And um where was I going with that? You see, my thought process just it's got to drop back in. See, this is what happens. I, 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 was, I was like, okay, I've got to, I want to ask you something and then I want to share something. Oh, our soul's journey. There we go. we just got to ask it to drop back in. Um, but, you know, we came to New Zealand and it's helped my husband and I to feel safe again. The way we felt, you know, as, as children, we grew up, we have a safety box, I'm sorry, an honesty box, two, two roads up the road, mm -hmm. two houses up the road from us where people pick fruit and we go and put money in the box and we're able to go and get the fruit in there. Mm. And, but the part of us that comes from a big city, you know, Joe big pumps and it's adrenaline and it's, oh, it's got a vibe and Africa has a vibe. The head kicks in and goes, why are we here? What brought us here? And um, what's fascinating is it's helping our bodies to relearn how to be and feel safe. 
Safety mm. is everything, isn't it? Yeah. And it's when we, you know, and because because both Brent and I are like, oh, this country is too small and blah, 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 blah. And, and then I say, but hang on, our soul has directed us here. Because if we weren't meant to be here, even you and me, if mm. we weren't meant to be here, we wouldn't be here. It wouldn't have aligned in the most magical way. And again, just to go back to the victim triangle, it's where do we sit as a rescuer? We have the, the need to be needed. We want to fix other people. We want to jump in. We want to, you know, and, and then we go off our alignment. We're not in a space of trust. When we're the perpetrator or the bully, that's where the anger comes up. And we're all parts. You said it earlier mm -hmm. on, many parts of ourselves. And, you know, the victim is the, oh, my God, this is happening to me. And why is this happening to me? And we moan and bitch and moan and bitch. And that's <laughs> just the way we've been programmed. So for me, I say to any client, when you hear those negative, those 60,000, perhaps 10% of them maybe are positive or 5% of them are positive, you just say stop. And I teach people, picture my hand or picture a stop sign. Stop. Stop, stop, stop. Big breaths. Yes, but blah, 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 stop. And, and it took me a practice mm -hmm. for years and years when I go into that monkey brain. And it took me a practice to take a few big breaths, take a few big breaths, and then bring in the positive affirmation or the positive statement or the positive mm -hmm. knowing. And, you know, a positive knowing is something as simple as just breathing in the love, breathing out the love. And if we set our timers for five minutes to 10 minutes a day, if we're in that monkey mind and we just breathe in, even the word love, and we just breathe it directly into our hearts and we breathe it out and we breathe it in, energetically, emotionally, everything starts to shift. Wow. Everything, like everything. They've done, they've done, they've done science-based recordings on this. Which I love, where one person's person, you know, it's it's they put them in the machines. Like, have you ever heard about this? Yeah, I have. Yes, and the brain waves start to shift, and and it's just so simple. But man, alive, it's been taught that, and it's it, that, that for me is self regulation, self love, yeah. bringing it in because we're taught to. I was taught to. You remember how I said. I've got to find it on the outside. Just love me. Just love me. Just love me. Come on. Just, I'll behave in the way that you want me to. I'm batshit crazy, but hey, I'll behave in the way that you want me to. <laughs> and then I'll just, I'll make sure everything's controlled. I'll cook for you. One of my love languages is to cook. I'll cook and feed you. Um, I'll clean the house. And you just, but do you notice my, my body response? It's like, da, da. Mm. And that's not coming from a state of grace. When we come from a space of grace, a state of grace, we're in acceptance of where we're at. So it can happen so easily that we can be triggered. And triggered is, is, is for me, it's a, it's a definition of so many different variables, not just one specific thing. And I still get triggered. I still have my moments where I'm like, what? What? <laughs> Human behavior is one of the most fascinating things. <laughs> to be the observer is without judgment, and I 100% judge. I can emphatically say that we're just like, oh, what made a person, what? <laughs> and then I have a little chuckle, and I'm like, okay, Michelle, stop it, stop it, stop it. You're not perfect by any means. But I share this because I want people to know that as much as I – I channel as much as I work with spirit, as much as I work with grief and trauma, I'm still very real in who I am because those are parts of myself that play themselves out. And if I'm in judgment, the universe, in South Africa, we say we have a little clap, click, little like wake up calls. The universe mm -hmm. goes, okay, you think you got it all right? Let me give you a little universal clap. <laughs> and then you're like, okay, guys, I'm back to love and light. <laughs> <laughs> and joy it's about the seeking of joy and the more we are in the joyful space the joyful state you know being joyful have you ever watched children they just yeah. you know they just in the moment 
and they cry. And then if you're there as a parent to just nourish them, nurture them, it's okay, I've got you. And then they're like, well, shake it off like a dog. They shake it off (laughs) like water. And then they're like, okay, back again. And that's what I feel like is part of us teaching the world. Yeah, thank you. I remember being a kid and uh, it took forever to my for my next birthday to come. It just took forever, right. it seemed like. You know, especially the last few months, it was just seemed like it was never going to come. But now it seems like my birthday's really quick. They, yes, yes. Because we live so, more in the present moment as a kid. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. So can I ask you a personal question and sure, that you may sure. answer it or not? Mm-hmm. Um, how did you get out of the gangs and off the streets? I'm um, suffering. Um, I had a lot of suffering. Um, I, Carl Jung says there's no coming to consciousness without pain. Um, I, I st- and I realized that um, when I had my uh, spiritual awakening, I was in so much pain. Um, it woke me up. Like and physical woke- pain or emotional uh, pain? All of the above. Yeah. Okay. Physical, emotional, uh, um, mental. Uh, I was just in so much pain that I finally woke up, and then I woke up into a different state of consciousness, where I, I, I like I had a whole different worldview. It's just everything just shifted in me. Some there was an inner shift that happened, and of course I learned how to work on myself and li- utilize principles and, and question stuff and, and look at things. But um, that and that started to help change me as well. I had many different awakenings. I think people think it's just a one, one time mm-hmm. process, but we're always having different types of uh, aha moments or awakenings, and and going through back into the mud and coming back, letting the lotus flower blossom again, and you know. So, mm-hmm. and, and that's what I loved about your story, and uh, I really appreciate it. Um, I didn't get to talk about your channeling. It's getting late, um, but can we touch on that just uh, briefly so- for a little bit? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, sorry, you... look at the time. You see, we just, oh, yeah. I just, sorry, man. Um, no, I really appreciate it. <laughs> I, oh, thank you. Uh, so they've always been talking to me, uh, and I didn't know at the time that they were talking to me. And like, even when I would, you know, go on these different retreats or go on different courses and all these different learnings, I'd always have this, there was these voices, but I never mm. got to ask who they were. And then it, we came to New Zealand and like I said, you know, New Zealand's helped us to calm our nervous systems down, to to feel safer in ourselves. And um, talking to spirit, loved ones who have passed over, is very different to working with the Council of Eight. Michelle, who's the other personality, takes a step aside. But the one day I just said, who are you guys? <laughs> and then they said, the council. So I saw them sort of sitting at the desk and, you know, like this council. And, <laughs> and I had my own version. But before that, I already with when I had in-person clients, I was doing these eights on their bodies and and I started doing these tonings and they were coming through me and they guided me to play more music in my therapy. Mm. And I started to sing and I was like, I'm Lady Gaga. And no, I'm not. <laughs> and uh, I couldn't hit the notes, but I was like, I think I can be like Lady Gaga. And I uh, even manifested a piano, like a free <laughs> piano okay, in lockdown, played it <laughs> twice, just be a, <laughs> gifted it. You know, when you have those moments of like, ah, I think I can do this. Anyway, but they were teaching me in the singing, in the work with, with, with music to start, because op- I had to learn to find my voice in a different way, like my octave, you know, and, and it was fascinating, this whole process, because then they, 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 I said, come on, guys, like, I need, I need a name. Like, for me, it's important uh, because we know that people want labels. And they, they would say, Michelle, they used to play with me. Michelle, it doesn't matter doesn't matter what matters is the healing that happens in the vibration of the body Mm. and and then I said okay well who are you the council the council of eight oh gosh and I was like who are you they said well it doesn't matter we're a consciousness and then I said okay guys how can you give me a description to explain who you are and then the one day I, I think I was typing it or writing it and they said angelic beings of light ascended masters who have once worked walked the earth planes I said, okay, well, who are you? Still questioning, who are you? <laughs> and they, they're very funny because they say, oh, Michelle, we're just hanging out, you know. We, we're waiting for you to come to the party. And what was fascinating was they started showing me that they were in the formation of Gandhi, Mother Mary, Mother Teresa, Nelson Mandela, Princess Diana. And I was mm. like, wow. 
wow, you are these energies, you know, these people that have made differences, massive differences within our world. And again, I started to question myself going into doubt, like everybody else does this. Why have you guys chosen me? And they say, it doesn't matter. It's not about the choosing. It's about we want to express, we want to come through you. And that was where I had to learn to trust myself because I believe in these different realms of the work and these different realms of um, the spiritual journey that we're all on. It's always easy to compare ourselves to others. Mm -hmm. And I was really, really nervous of putting myself out there because of fear of getting judged. Uh, fear of, well, who do you think you are? You know, are they really real? But then the messages started to make sense. And I said to them, it's kind of like we made a contract. Can you keep it simple? I like simplicity. Uh, can we keep it simple? Because I want to bring the messages of simplicity. And I can honestly share with you, Boo Boo, that the profoundness of not only the vibration of how they come through, but the profoundness of the messages that they deliver are on point all the time. They share truth. And I wow. often hear clients coming back and saying, like in the moment, the council of eight would say something as an example, like you hate men. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> and then the person would go blood red. So there you know, there's a visceral reaction. There's a reaction in the body. We, we want to help you expand your throat, you know, learn to speak your truth. Don't know what that means. And then clients will come back and email me and say, Michelle, we re-listen to it because they speak in symbolism and they speak metaphorically. But the beautiful part of what I have been incredibly, incredibly honored about, and it even happened in Egypt when, um, so I started bringing these tonings or these keenings. I believe keenings is an old, old word of saying it, but these tonings would come through almost operatic, op like an opera singer. And they'd mm. say to the person, we're going to help you with your sorrow because you, you, you know, you've got stuff going on your lower back and they just feel into the body, almost like a me medical medium. So they just see vibration. And I often, even with my connection, I think, I've got to remember this. Oh my God, you guys are brilliant. I've got to remember this. And then there's parts of it I remember and there's parts that I don't. And I'm okay with it because it's delivering the message to the person that's receiving it. Mm. They are, in my opinion, nothing short of phenomenal. They get the human in the moment. They share Akashic records. They share timelines, past lives. Um, you know, people ask about their future and they always bring it back to the now. They always bring it back to how do you see yourself in the now? Mm. And the most important part for me is that they are so funny and they make um, they make life lighthearted for us as humans because they are showing up for humanity. Mm. So it is Michelle, the personality steps aside and they come through and they deliver a message that is needed to be here, heard in the moment. Often not what we want to hear, like this, you know, this person had said, she doesn't hate men. And then she emailed, <laughs> she said, oh my gosh, Michelle, at least a hundred times a day I say I hate men. I, like she started to consciously hear her words. Wow. which words are vibration. So that's what I've honestly been absolutely in awe of is the honoring of how they show up for humanity. And I feel incredibly blessed to share their work, to share their messages. I never know what's going to come through and it doesn't really matter because it's not, it's not about me. It's about the person sitting opposite me. Wow. And it's about the vibration of what comes through. And sorry, I was going to say to you in Egypt, my jaw, I could feel my bones when we we're in the pyramid and my jaw started to like shift. And since I've come back from Egypt, my tonings or their tonings coming through me, should I say, is so different. Mm. I'm blown away as to what the notes I can hold. And somebody measured the ones, um, the Hertz's, uh, and the one was love, and I didn't know this. And the other one was, uh, what was it, love? And I can't remember the other one what it was. But somebody had measured on one of the podcasts I was on. And I was like, wow, <laughs> that's incredible. <laughs> that's amazing. And people can viscerally feel 
their vibration shift. They'll say, my, it feels like all my cells are tingling right now. Wow. And I love that. So I feel, yeah. I feel on it that um, there's, there's, a, there's, there's a, a change that happens for the person sitting opposite me. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's probably late. I don't know if you have time to ask a couple of questions or we can maybe do a, another session and, and another part two or something. I would love that. And um, questions? Do you have? Uh, do, do you, would you like me to bring them through? Is that what you mean? Yeah. Would that be? Would that be? I'd I'd love that if you're okay with that. Oh yeah, I'm fine. Okay, yeah. I'm just going to take a sip of water. We welcome you here today to this wonderful interconnectedness between two human beings that have been on a journey of massive transformation. We say to you, and as we are keeping Michelle's eyes open, please notice how we say this, her eyes are open. As you know, the eyes are the windows to the soul. Mm. And we say to you, as you are bringing massive transformation, not only to yourself, we say to you that this massive transformation in this evolutionary process of change, change, change. And please notice how we use Michelle's hands. Change is within nature. Nature is going through massive transformation too, is it not? Mm -hmm. And as nature is becoming more implosive in the explosions of what is shifting vibrationally, we say to you that this is an important moment in time within the shifting of the cause, the cause, the cause, the cause, or the calls, the calls, the calls. Many of you are calling out, calling out, calling out, please bring the change, please bring the change. Yet we say to you as we open up Michelle's eyes, the change is within you. The change is about the frequency of how you are connecting into the evolutionary process of the all of the oneness. Mm. You are all interconnected into the oneness. This is nothing that is, should we say, rocket science? Should we say that this is, we are telling you? Should we say that we believe that you know, you know, you know, you know? And we say, yes, you do know. <laughs> You all have the knowing of truth. And as you are learning to find the expression of your version of your truth, of your multidimensional connectedness into source, mm -hmm. into divine, into a space of love. And as we say to you that notice there are two people here right now, that are here, bringing interconnectedness. There is a resonance in the interconnectedness of change. And we know that in the uprooting, in the uprooting, in the uprooting, you are all a part of nature. Yet when nature performs, humans question nature. Yet it is all about the cleansing process. As you and Michelle have deeply gone through massive amounts of cleansing, and we applaud you, we applaud you, we applaud you for this massive amount of cleansing. We say to you, nature cleanses too, does it not? Mm. So we know that in this global shift, global reset, global awakening, ascension, hmm, what else do you humans use? Transformation, change, becoming. It does not matter to us in terms of what the ultimate way of being is about. What matters is that you are finding the moments in time to bring the equal to within the pause. Mm. And as you bring the moments of Silence, peace, 
this brings the exploration of validation within this ascension process. We hope this makes sense. Do you have any questions for us, please? Yes, thank you. Um, collective trauma, multi-generational trauma in the planet. How do we start to heal from that and bring us back to the oneness of life? You are already doing it. Your question is answering you right now in this moment. Mm -hmm. And as you are intergenerationally connected in the interconnectedness, as you are ancestrally connected into the land, everything is energy, is it not? Mm -hmm. And as everything is in flow, it is about the cause and effect. Cause and effect. And as you are bringing cause, as you are bringing change, as you are bringing a remarkable effect into other humans' lives, this brings change. So notice again how we use Michelle's hands. It is about bringing up and bringing down. Bringing up and bringing down. So as you are finding a space of being in the moment of, may we say, down, being in the moment of the depression. This is where one is looking deep within oneself. And when one is looking deep within oneself, as you dive deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper, there is a cleansing that happens, that happens. It is that simple, beloved boo-boo. Mm. And as you are going through the cleansing, there is expansion. And as there is expansion, you reconnect into the interconnectedness. A flower does not grow overnight, does it? Mm. You plant a seed. You water the seed. You nourish the seed. Or not. And if you do not nourish the seed, the seed will die off. You humans are fixators. You fixate, 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 fixate. And as you fixate on things, you cannot breathe. <laughs> you humans are so funny. <laughs> you came into this world with breath. You came into this world as a miracle. And yet you see yourselves as of a different form. Yet we say to you, you are formation. You are miraculous. And as you find your new form, your new way of being, your new state, change. Everything is change. We hope this makes sense. Thank you. Um... Reincarnation, it makes sense, but it doesn't make sense to other people. What's the whole purpose of reincarnation? Learning. Hmm. It is simple. This morning, Michelle's husband, he thought of himself as a man who did not like animals, yet they have a cat. They had a dog. They have a dog. They had a dog, and they have a dog, and they have a dog. And in this process of being a cat, being a dog, being a human, there is a reincarnation that happens every single time. And in the process of taking a pause, taking a moment, the vibration of the cat found herself to be jumping on the bed. And her husband looked at the cat, heard the cat purring, and said, I think I once was a cat, as I love this cat. Mm. So when one seeks or senses or feels the vibration, no matter what it is, you have once been this. You have said it yourself, have you not, boo-boo? You mm -hmm. have been all parts. When you are all parts, your soul has been partially parted. Mm. And when your soul is partially parted, it is being reconnected to all of source. So when it is partially parted, many, as you know, 
may believe in what, who, you are. Many, as you know, may believe in what Michelle is right now in this moment. Notice how we say this, is. We are you. You are us. Hmm. You have a name. We have a name. Michelle has a name. Yet in the reincarnation, it is about the vibration of the word and what it states. When one is in disbelief of change, one does not want to believe in reincarnation. Simple, is it not? Thank you. Uh, one more quick question, if you don't mind. Please go ahead. Where, what is God? You. Mm -hmm. You knew this. <laughs> <laughs> you humans. You are a hue of light. You are a multidimensional being of color. Every single one of you. And you are within. And as you are within, you are without. You are all source. You are all connected. You are. You are. You are. May we please bless you with your own God-like light. Please allow your breath to flow in and out, in and out. We thank you. Namaste. Namaste. So. Wow, thank you. How are you feeling? It feels great. I heard Om in the background, like quietly in the background. Wow. The Om Amazing. vibration. Yeah. Wow. Oh, I'm just feeling you right now. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, thank you for coming on. I really appreciate it. You yeah. are so welcome. And thank you for um, inviting me. And thank you for your presence in this world. Uh, thank you. And um, how can we find you? I have a website, which is www.michellecarpenter.co.nz. And people can book in either for a Council of Eight session a one-on-one -on -one or a mediumship session if you want to connect with a loved one or you want to work on your grief and trauma. Uh, we also have the Council of Eight community every Sunday in the States mm. uh, and every Monday morning New Zealand time, 8 a.m. New Zealand time. It's a beautiful community, beautiful, you know, tribe. People are very open-hearted and uh, we share real stuff, you know. We share very open-hearted moments of truth. Uh, and then I channel and people are able to ask individual questions. And um, I have an Instagram account, Michelle Carpenter underscore, I think it is. And I'm on Facebook, uh, Mish Medium, Michelle Carpenter Medium. Sorry, I always get confused. You'd think I'd know this by now, hey? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, hey, you'll find me if you meant to. <laughs> I have some people going, they scan YouTube and then all of a sudden, boom, there I am on the side. <laughs> <laughs> like okay sorry about that <laughs> but yes ultimately on my on my um my website is the best and uh please we walk this journey together yeah thank you that is it you're so welcome thank you <laughs> thank you i appreciate it and uh, what i got right now is trauma is not our fault but it's our responsibility to do that inner work and um uh, absolutely i really appreciate it and 
Thank you for coming And that's on. the massive shift because we are part of that shift, you know, and it's not egotistical to say that everybody that's doing the work right now, that's part of this monumental, um, amazing vibrational change. Mm. And we're in it. We're all in it. Anybody listening to this, even if they are like, oh, I don't know, where do I start? Start by asking your guides, hey, mm. give me a book. You know, and the book might fall out in front of you. Somebody might say, here we go. Here's a book. I think you need to read this. The universe has the most amazing ways of sharing and showing up for us. Mm. So thank you for all you're doing. Well, thank I really you. I appreciate you. You're welcome. I appreciate you too. Take care. Thank you. Have a beautiful day, boo-boo. Take you care. Too. Lots Namaste. of love. Yeah. Namaste. Namaste. I love, how do you say it? Namaste. Namaste. I love that. <laughs> Hey, like, sizzle. Like Snoop Dogg. <laughs> With your shizzle. <laughs> I feel like I'm a rapper. No, no, I'm not. <laughs> you probably could rap, eh? Hey? <laughs> could you rap? Um, A little bit. You'll hear at the end of this episode, once it's recorded, you'll hear me. <laughs> yeah. Okay, awesome. Yay, I look forward to it. <laughs> well, take care. Have a beautiful day. You too, take, Babu. Take care. Uh -huh. Bye. Bye-bye. It's snowy out here. No, we all here working in a major way. Had to speak on it just to make a break. Any given subject, no, we make a way. Time to level up on the day to day. No, we all here working for the greater good. Expand your mind, broaden your lens the way you should. From the stars to the galaxy to speak on spirituality. I understand for the neighborhood.